I'm Pastor Josh. And I'm Pastor Tara. We want to welcome you to our YouTube page and we pray that today you are blessed by everything you experience. And if you are blessed by this sermon, please don't forget to share it with someone in your world. Let's go live to the message. We can get ourselves ready to have a wonderful redemptive moment this morning at Redemption Church. And I think the Lord is going to speak to us in a way I think it will become very precious to you. What you're going to hear today is, I think, when most people get together and when they talk about what they do for the kingdom of God, which is okay and which is nice, but most of the time we talk about what we do for the kingdom, what we do for the Lord. Do you know what I mean? Like, you have a bunch of ministers in a room and everybody is sharing and explaining what they do for the kingdom. Nothing wrong about that. But a couple of years ago, I asked myself, since this question comes up all the time, also when I meet someone, like I have met a lot of people during this week here in South Africa, everybody's asking you, what are you, do, what are you doing for the kingdom? What, what are you doing for the Lord? So a couple of years ago, I was thinking along this line, and I thought to myself, what is the Lord doing for us? That should be the question. The better question to ask, actually, is what is God doing for you instead of what are you doing for God? Isn't that interesting? Like if I talk with Ellen, we talk about what we do for the kingdom. I already know what he does for the kingdom. He knows what I do. I'm right now preaching. I don't have to explain this, right? I'm right now preaching. I'm ministering. You know what I do for the kingdom. But what is the king doing for you is much more important than what I do. Amen. Amen. So this is the title of my message what is Jesus doing for you right now? Yeah. Amen? Amen? And guys, I, br I brought you some images. You can put it up. This is the title. This is what we talk about this morning. Do I have your attention? Do you know what Jesus is doing for you right now? That's the question. Are you sure what he is doing for you right now? Could you answer the question, what the Lord in heaven is doing for you right now while you're sitting there and smiling? Huh? Amen. That's a good question, I think. <laughs> and you know, once we realize and once we understand what he is doing for us right now, I'm telling you, your life changes forever. Amen. And it, this is not an empty promise. I will guarantee your life is going to be transformed like never before. It's no empty promise. This is a guarantee. Once, because you see, grace is all about the loveliness of Christ, of the person of Christ and the perfection of his work. The, the most, the unique part, the most unique part of our message of grace we preach is having Christ in the center of it all. Right? And that is what changes everything. What happens when grace comes into your life? Here is here is what happens when grace comes into your life. When grace comes, blind eyes are going to be opened. That's why you have the story in John chapter 9 about the man born blind. When Jesus came into his life, his blind eyes were opened. Isn't that beautiful? Whenever Jesus comes into your life, your eyes will open. Open for what? Open for the wonderful truth of God. Open for the grace of God. Open for the Son of God. Open for the Word of God. Whenever grace comes, our blind eyes are going to open up. Hallelujah. And this is 
wonderful, the wonderful, miracle-working, hallelujah, ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, but before we are going to answer this question, what is Jesus? Well, you know, the way I pronounce Jesus, I really have to try hard because it's my Swiss English, which we call Swinglish, is like, I'm not talking about Swiss cheese. I'm talking about Jesus, okay? I really have to, because we, 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 we like to say Jesus. <laughs> okay, that's how we say it, it's Jesus. And we don't mean cheese, okay? We mean Jesus, praise the Lord. So like all my friends tell me all the time that when you say Jesus, we don't think about Jesus. We think about breakfast. <laughs> and so, so excuse my swinglish, okay? But you can follow me, right? Okay, just that to get, like, get, let's get rid of that choke, okay? <laughs> so, what is Jesus? Before I can answer you, what he's doing for you right now, you must understand who he is for you right now, okay? Before you can know what he does, you must understand who he is. Before I understand what Alan does, I must understand who he is, that he is one of the pastors. And it's similar with our Lord. Before we understand what he does, who is he for you right now? And to have a clear understanding who he is, you must understand that Jesus stands in three offices. He holds three offices. That's what we call it. He stands in three offices. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus came from heaven to earth, 2,000 years ago, when he came to the land of Israel, he came as a prophet. And he stood in the ministry of a prophet. Why? The reason why he came as a prophet is, and once you realize what a prophet is doing, you understand this. A prophet mediates God to man. That's what a prophet does. That's the job description of a prophet. He mediates God to man. Jesus came into a man-made religious system called Judaism. And he came into that system, and because so much was wrong with that system, all the self-maintenance, all the self-efforts, and the self-righteousness in that system, he had to mediate the true nature of God to the Jewish belief system back then. So he came as a prophet and he mediated the true nature of God, the Father's heart, to them. That's what he did as a prophet, coming to Israel, coming to earth. Now you know the story, they rejected him. What was the reason why he was always like crashing with the Pharisees? crashing with the people back then. Why, why he, he was always in conflict with them? It was him mediating the true nature clashes with their religious system. Can you follow me? So that's why Jesus came and the first office he stood in was the office of prophet. And he mediated God to man. Whenever you read the Gospels, you see Jesus in the office of prophet. But that changed from John 17 on. John 17 is a very interesting chapter in your Bible. It's where, people, where, where Jesus is in the garden and praying a prayer, and that prayer is called the high priestly prayer. So that was the beginning of a transition. 
John 17 is the beginning of a transition. What kind of transition? It's the beginning of a shift. Him moving from one office to the other. Can you follow me? So when Jesus died, hung on the cross, suffered, died, and when he rose again after three days, he rose again as high priest. He rose, he died as a lamb, and he rose as high priest. So when he rose, the moment he rose again, that transition that started in John 17 finished, and from that moment on, from the resurrection day, Jesus stands in another office, and it's the office of high priest. And since then, he stands in that office and he operates in that office. So right now, and his present day ministry, or let me put it that way, the present day ministry of Jesus Christ is the ministry of him being your high priest. And that, ladies and gentlemen, changes all. So Jesus right now is your high priest. He is your good shepherd and high priest. So you say, Pastor, I don't read that in the Gospels. You don't. You only see the transition in the Gospels. I already said it, John 17. But to understand his ministry as high priest, you must understand the book of Hebrews. Because the book of Hebrews, and we believe Paul wrote that book, describes his new office he's standing in right now, and this is high priest. So through Paul, through the letters of Romans, and especially through the book of Hebrews, you realize what he's doing right now. You realize who he is right now and in what kind of office he stands in. So ladies and gentlemen, present day ministry of Jesus Christ. He's not prophet anymore. He used to be prophet and he stood in the office of prophet. Right now, he is your high priest. He's your good shepherd and he's your high priest because this goes together. Even Psalms 23, the wonderful psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's a, sh that's, 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 the, that's a psalm of the good shepherd, our high priest. Because the book of Hebrews addresses that. The book of Hebrews calls him our great high priest and good shepherd. So as long as we're here as the church is on earth, that's his most important and primarily ministry he stands in. Right now, he's your high priest. But there is a third office, which is a future office. And he will receive that office. It's the office of king. So Jesus stands in three offices, prophet, priest, and king. Does it sound similar or familiar to Old Testament writings, stories, and concepts? Yes, absolutely. You see these three offices all over as a type and shadow in the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings. And Jesus fulfilled all three offices ultimately. So listen to me. I know he is the king of my heart, and he is the king of your heart, but officially, he's not yet king. When will he become king? When will he stand in the office of king? When he returns for the messianic kingdom. When Jesus comes back, a new era will be started, a new dispensation or household will start. 
we call it the millennium, the 1,000 year rule and reign of Christ. And he is the king all over the world, reigning and ruling from Jerusalem. Hallelujah. And that is the office of king. So he will stand for 1,000 years. He will stand in that office of king. So it's a future office. We already call him king of my heart. But it's officially, it's a future office that is to come. So right now and, and until he returns, he will be your high priest. So to understand what he does for you, you must understand who he is for you. Who is Jesus for you as a child of God, as a son and as, as a daughter, as a disciple? Who is Jesus for you? He's much more than just your Redeemer. He's much more than just your Lord. He's much more than just your Savior. He's your High Priest. Because Him being your Redeemer, Him being your Savior, you all needed then, you all needed that when you got saved a couple of years ago. Then you needed Him as your Savior. Then you needed Him as your Redeemer. But to carry out redemption and salvation in your life, it needs to be, He needs to be your High Priest. Can you follow me? Is this interesting or does this put you to sleep? <laughs> you can pick. This one is for interesting. This one, this, one is, this one is for put me to sleep, brother. Okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But the shouting part is coming, okay? The dancing part is coming. So now we know who he is. Amen? Well, now we understand what office he stands in. Because I'm really honest to you, for most people, this verse is not a reality. They don't have this promise in their lives. Can you, <coughs> can you give me Romans 8 verse 1? This verse I'm going to read is for most people is not a reality. There is therefore now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1. For most people this is not a reality. That there is no more condemnation in their lives is not a reality. Most people feel condemned, guilty. They have a lack of a consciousness of I'm not condemned, I'm uncondemned, I'm, no, I'm not, I do not need to have condemnation in my life. Most people carry around condemnation. And whatever it is. But the Bible promises us that there is therefore now, now, faith is now, no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The reason why this is not a reality for most people is because, listen to me very carefully, they don't know what Jesus is doing for them right now. You get that one? That's why it's not a reality. That's why they, they are con feel condemned, walk around with all kinds of condemnation and failures from the past, fears for the future, because they don't know what the high priest is doing for them right now. So this verse becomes a reality. This will be transformation power for you once you realize what Jesus is doing for you. 
Now, after you know who he is for you, I can start answering you the question, what he is doing for you right now. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for a redemptive moment? Are you ready for one of the most beautiful revelations? I call it the top three in the whole world of, word of God. We're talking about the top three, okay? We're talking about Messi, Ronaldo, Neymar. Okay? I had to say Messi first since the last ballon d'or. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you know what I mean? Like the top three, okay? So this is, I'm sure, belongs to the top three. This revelation, it will blow your mind. It will blow your socks off. I don't have to wear socks here in South Africa. That's really nice. Back home, I couldn't do that. It's too cold. So let's look at this. Hebrews 7 25 answers you what he does for you right now. This is the verse. And you should write it down. You should take up, you should take out your phone and click. Not selfie. Turn around the camera. You know, click Jesus, not yourself. Oh, thank you, Pastor. Click, click, <laughs> click, click, click. No. Switch the camera. Click the verse. Okay? Guys, you can put it up. Consequently, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. So who is this? You and me. We are in Christ because we drew near to God through him. The way to the Father is Christ. I am the way, I am the life, he is the way. Right? <coughs> Let's continue to read. Since he always <coughs> lives to make intercession for them. So guys, just leave it up there, the verse. So Jesus prays for you right now. That's his present day ministry. He does intercession for you. Intercession is prayer. Intercession is pleading the case. Jesus, right now, on the behalf of every believer and continually is interceding for you. I said, Christ continually interceding on the behalf of the believer. Friends, most religions, and normally, most and other religions, people are praying to their gods. But here, your God is praying for you. That's unheard of. Correct? Who has heard such things? In all the religions, they must pray to their gods and hope, and hope they calm them down. My prayers, I hope, relaxes them. You know? Pleases them. Most People pray to please God. But your God is praying for you every single day. Because as the high priest, Jesus has a session. What's his session? His session is he sits at the right hand of the Father. That's his session. Right? We're having a session this morning. Jesus has a far more better session this morning. He sits. We're sitting here also, right? 
We sit together, but he sits at the right hand of the Father. What's he doing there? Making intercession on the behalf of every believer on this planet. Come! That's your God. That's your high priest. This is what he is doing for you right now. So put it up again, Romans 7, verse 25. This word, intercession, this word intercession, look, look at it again. He is able to save to the uttermost. Friends, you cannot lose your salvation as long as he is praying for you. Come on. He is consequently able to save you to the uttermost. Do you know what that means in the Greek? That means in the Greek that you are arriving at your final destination. And I'm not talking about the movie. <laughs> because that's the reason why I will never do eye lasering. That's the reason why I never do eye surgery with a laser, because I watched Final Destination. <laughs> Who also watched it? That's where the girl's eye popped out, you know, because everybody forgot about her. And the laser's just burning through her whole head. You know, that's where, when I saw it, I decided I never do eye, eye lasering. No, no, that's not for me. No, 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 no. <laughs> You know what I mean? We're not talking about final destination. You're not going to die. You are going to live forever. Yeah. Right? Because final destination is all about dying in all kinds of ways. You know, roller coaster, Formula One. You know, I watched them all. Ah, man, I shouldn't watch them all, you know. Too bad, man. No, his final destination is you live for, to the uttermost because you live forever. Because he lives forever. Let's put it up again. Look what it says. It says again, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those, that's us, who draw through him, that's us. So once he got you saved, he now looks that you stay saved. He that got you saved keeps you saved. You can't keep yourself safe. Listen, how come Christianity got that idea that everybody agrees I can't save myself? Right? I need a redeemer. Everybody agrees on this. I cannot save myself. But how did Christianity got the idea from once I used my Savior and He saved me. Now I keep myself saved. That doesn't make sense. Because if it would be that way, nobody would save, be saved in here. We all would have lost our salvation. Because I can't keep my, I can't get myself saved and I can't keep myself saved. Both needs my Redeemer. And the initial salvation where I got saved years ago, He was my Redeemer, Savior. Keeping me saved, He's my High Priest. Do you see that? You see that why it needs Him as your High Priest. Your High Priest keeps you saved. Why? Because He's praying for you. Hey, I preach myself happy. <laughs> As you see the smile on my face, it just stays there. I can't put it off. That's what he does. He prays for me. So I keep, he keep by his praying, him praying for me, that keeps me saved. You say, oh, pastor, this is a holy cow. This is some good chocolate, but unbiblical. I'll prove it to you, okay? I'll prove it to you. 
Let's find out what the word intercession means. Okay? So put it up, guys. Hebrews 7, 25 again. That word intercession, he's interceding for us. That word at the end, <coughs> last line, he always lives. Jesus rose to pray for you. Because that's the reason why he lives now. He always lives to make intercession for us. This word is a very special word in the Greek that only occurs five times. So how many know five is the number for grace? Right? So it only occurs five times in the New Testament. And guys, I'll send you an image called entinchano. You can put it up. This is the word for an intercession in the Greek. And here is what it means. It's the Greek word, Strong's number 1793. It's entinchano. Say it with me. Entinchano. Say it again. Entinchano. Say it again. Entinchano. And it means make intercession, plead, hit the mark, meaning hit the bullseye. You know, like a target. Hitting the bull's eye right in the middle. That's hitting the mark. So entinchano is the word for this intercessory prayer. And Jesus does entinchano for you. Okay? That's what Jesus does. He does entinchano for you. But how many know there is always to every word an antonym, an opposite? Like I say yes. What's the opposite? No, that's the antonym. I say, come. You say, go. You see, that's the antonym. That's the opposite word. To this Greek word, there is also an antonym, an opposite. Okay? And here is the opposite to entinchano. Give me hamartano. Strong's 264. Hamartano is the opposite to entinchano. Because hamartano comes from the Greek word hamartia, and this means sin. Sin. Do wrong. What is sin in the Greek? Just simply and clearly, it's missing the mark. That's what sin is. Most people think about sin, about that one biggie, you know, between male and female. That only, but that's just one type of sin. There is so much more to sin. Jealousy is a sin. You know? <laughs> There's so much more to it. It's not just sexual sins. Sin is always wherever you miss the mark, God's mark, you have sinned. And it doesn't need to be sexual. It can be anything else. Wherever you miss the mark... According to God's standards, you done wrong, failed, and you sinned. So the antonym, the opposite of entinchano is hamartano. So here is what happens. Guys, can you give me 1 John 2, 1? 1 John Two and one, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does hamartano, that's the word. If anyone does hamartano, does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. The righteous. And what is the advocate doing when we miss the mark? He intercedes for you, and through his intercession, you're still going to hit the bullseye. Hallelujah. That's what he's doing for you. He is praying for you when you miss it. That's why he steps in like the old priest. The old, the, the, like in the Old Testament, the priest, 
the high priests in the Old Testament, they had to step in for the national sin of Israel and plead their case. And God could turn around and could favor them again because they stepped in. And once a year, they had a big day called Yom Kippur. They big time stepped, big time in. So the Old Testament is a type and shadow of the real thing, which is Christ as our high priest doing for you and me, for the believer, or on the behalf of the believer. When I miss it, he prays. Every single time you miss it, Jesus is interceding. Now, don't keep him necessarily busy. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? This is not like, whoa, all right. Wow, really? Amsterdam, red light district, I'm coming. I'm booking my flight. Can you land at red light district there? No, we go to Schiphol. Do you know, it's, this is not a license to sin. Do, do you understand? Can you follow me? This is not a license to sin more, knowing how he intercedes on the behalf of us. <coughs> this is a passport to love more. Right? Because when you know you're forgiven much, then you can start forgiving others. There is no one in this building, not one person, not one man, what, what, <coughs> one woman or one child of God in this room that is not able to forgive. Because once you understand how much you are forgiven through Antinchano, you can forgive that person that hurted you so much. <laughs> Do you know what the Lord told me once? I had a situation, that's a couple of years back, I had a situation which um, was very bad. Somebody really, really made me mad like nobody else did ever before, and it was not my wife, <laughs> okay? It was a guy um, I had to deal with concerning our apartment we rented. So th certain things happened, and something really bad happened to me, and I got so angry that I could, I could sense how bitterness rooted into my heart, how bitterness took root in my innermost being. And I, like, I have never experienced this kind or type of feeling I had. I hated that man so much. I was so through with this guy. And I knew this is not good. I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I know James too. You know, I said, this is not good. This shouldn't happen. Something goes wrong here because it really took hold of my heart. And it grabbed me and that anger was so much in me. I had to decide to go on a walk with God. I, it just, it robbed my, not, it didn't rob my night. It robbed my day and night. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> So it didn't even rob my sleep. It robbed my wake, wake, waking d d hours. So I had to decide to go on a walk with God and just talk about this idiot, you know. <laughs> I said, God, judge him, kill him. I mean, get me out of that contract, you know. Do, do anything you can. I mean, you know, send the angel of death. <laughs> and do it in the worst way Final Destination would do it. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm fed up, man. I never had that anymore. But it was, a, it was, a, it was frightening for me. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm a Christian, come on. I mean, it wouldn't be that bad if I'm a Christian, but I was also a preacher. It wouldn't be that bad to be a Christian and preacher. I was a pastor. I'm leading a church. Thousands of thousands listen to me every Sunday. And I'm praying for Final Destination Part 7. <laughs> Everything on him. Like if he doesn't get killed through the roller coaster, send him to eye surgery. <laughs> Both eyes. Zzz. And then make him suffer for hours. Very bad. I'm like, oh my goodness. Do you know, now here's a little, little side thought, but very important. Your soul is not saved yet. 
your spirit is saved. Because you are a spirit, you possess a soul, feelings and emotions, and you live in a body. Your soul and your body is not saved yet, but your spirit is the guarantee for salvation because your new birth took place in your spirit, not in your soul. That's why sin is not in your spirit. It's in your soul and in your flesh. You're listening to me. Welcome to Grace Academy. Okay? We call it spirit, soul, and body. It's very important that you understand that. That's the reason why you can get up in the morning. Okay? Sermon timer. Oh, I thought that was 15 minutes, but it was 15 seconds. Anyway. Okay. (laughs) Just found out, you know. So... So, your soul doesn't feel saved, but you're still saved because your spirit is saved. But your soul does not all the time feel safe. Do you get this? Very important. Okay, so you're not getting confused. And that's also the reason why you not always have to respond to altar calls. Just because you feel like bad doesn't mean you need to get saved again. Okay, amen. So, I'm on that walk. I calmed down. I uh, became Christian again, and I said, honestly, Lord, I don't know what to do, but I can, I just, I cannot forgive this guy. This is like, it's too bad. We're losing lots of money, and we're a young family, two young kids. That's years ago, two young kids. I didn't have all that savings. I'm like, I'm losing all my savings just because of this E. (laughs) Did you know idiotes is a Greek word, which is in your Bible? It's in 1 Corinthians 14. This, it's, it's there, really, not choking, Pastor Ellen. It's there where he talks about the, the guys that talking in <laughs> tongues. He said, those that un- don't understand, the unlearned. So, idiotes means unlearned. So, it's in 1 Corinthians 14, you know. Those that are against tongues because they, are, they don't understand what it is. So, that's the idiotes, okay. <laughs> so, I'm biblical. Come on, can you, don't judge me. I preach Bible, idiots. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I repent. I didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't me that said it. It wasn't me. Okay. So, I'm like, I can't forgive this guy. So, then the Lord spoke to me. And that was the moment everything was unrooted. Everything just left me. You know what God said? He said, my son, I have forgiven already your unforgiveness towards this man. I'm like, whoa, sorry, what? That's what the Lord spoke to me. He said, because I'm praying for you, because I'm interceding for you, I already forgave your unforgiveness towards this man. I'm, I was crying, you know, I was crying. And through that, I repented. So everything <laughs> left me. All the anger, all the unforgiveness just fall off. And I could totally forgive the man. And praise the Lord, the Lord worked it out. You know, he found somebody else that stepped in. And uh, we saved thousands and thousands of dollars just like two, three weeks later. But I first had to get rid of that unforgiveness. And the Lord spoke to me. Because you know, as I know, when Jesus was on the cross, He not only carried my past sins, He carried all sins. Past, present, and all my future sins. 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, Eric Engler didn't live. I was not alive 2,000 years ago. Jesus took my sin 2,000 years ago on Calvary. They nailed him on Golgotha. 2,000 years ago, all my sins were future. So all your future sins are already forgiven Because all your sins to begin with were already future. Right? 2,000 years ago. So friends, 
to wrap up this wonderful message. Jesus is your high priest. And because he's your high priest, he's doing intercession for you every single day. When you miss it, he's doing, when you do hamartano, he's doing entinchano. When you miss it, he hits the mark for you because you're in him. And yes, you do miss it. Yes, I do miss it. But in him, we always hit it. So can you see that this truth from Romans 8, that therefore there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, can become a reality when you know who He is for you and what He does for you. Now to wrap this up, <coughs> two more to show it and prove it to you while the music is playing. Go with me to Romans 8:34. Every doctrine needs to be established on two or three witnesses, the Bible says. Amen. Look at this. Romans 8:34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he who was raised, your high priest, ladies and gentlemen. Who is at the right hand of God? His session, ladies and gentlemen. And who indeed is interceding for us? Him doing entinchano, ladies and gentlemen. Can you see it? He died for you. He became your savior. He rose for you. He became your high priest. He's seated as high priest at the right hand of the Father. That's his session right now. And fourthly, <coughs> what is he doing there? Praying for you. Hallelujah. Entinchano, the same word, who indeed is interceding for us. The same word that it is used in Hebrews 7 here in Romans 8, 34. But you know, God, God, God always knows how to top it. Go with me to Romans 8, 26. Look at this. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself, Etin Chana, intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The whole Trinity is praying for you. Give me verse 27. The whole Trinity is in this. Because in verse 27 he says, <coughs> And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. That's the Father. Because the Spirit intercedes, and Tinchano, for the saints according to the will of God. So we have it in two verses again, 26 and 27. And Tinchano, God, the Spirit himself, Jesus, they're all in it. The whole Trinity is in this. Even the Holy Spirit is praying for you, your struggles and where you, what you go through. The Holy Spirit intercedes for you. Amen. When you pray in tongues, He co-intercedes for you. You groan, He groans. It's a super entinchano, so to speak. It's a hyper entinchano. Isn't that beautiful? That's what God is doing for us. It's not that much today what we are doing for God. It's all about what He does for you. And last but not least, look at this one. Look at this one. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. Now you understand this verse. You haven't understood this verse, but now you understand it. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Why did Job fail? Do 
you know Job, the oldest book in the Bible? It's called the book of Job. Why did Job fail? Job failed because there was no mediator between him and God. That's why he failed. Job saw the need. Last scripture, Job 9.33. Job saw the need. He saw the need. Job 9.33. He saw the need, but he also saw that there is no mediator. There is no arbiter, that's mediator, between us who might lay his hands on us both. There is no mediator between me and God, Job said. That's why Job failed. That's why his friends failed. All the advice, all the you should do this, you should break that, you should do that, try this, you know, all that failed because Job had no mediator. You will never fail because you will always have the mediator, the man, Christ Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's stand up. Let's stand up, ladies and gentlemen. The Lord is so good. He's so amazing. And He wants to become your high priest. If you're here in this building this morning and you're not sure if Jesus is your high priest, if He's your Savior, your high priest and your good shepherd, this is the moment you don't let go. He, he longs to pray for you. He yearns to make intercession for you. He longs, he just loves to pray for you. This is his heart. He yearns to make intercession for you. But you must become a child of God. He needs to be your redeemer because it's only for those that drew near to God through Him, and that is salvation. So ladies and gentlemen, this morning, it might be the most important morning in your whole life, and I would like to invite you, if you're not sure if Jesus is your mediator, if he is your savior, if you're not sure about that, I would love to invite you to pray with me a prayer to make Jesus your Lord and Savior and your personal high priest. Because as us being under our high priest, we become the objects of divine favor. We become the objects of divine favor every single day. Because the Father that knows the hearts and knows what the Spirit of God is praying for you and me, He will answer. He can't do anything else but answer all the prayers of the Spirit He's doing for you. He's interceding for you. You will become the divine object of divine favor. So I'll pray with you a short prayer to hand over your life to your precious Savior, Jesus, to present your life into His hands and making Him your high priest. Every head bowed, all the eyes closed. I'll pray short, just short. I'll give a moment and you can repeat with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. He came to earth. He lived on earth to show the way. He is the way. He died for me. He went to the cross to took my sins. He rose on the third day. He's my high priest now because Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior. You have forgiven all my sins, past, present, and future sins. Jesus, my Lord, my Savior, my Redeemer, 
this is my redemptive moment. Thank you, Jesus. And you are my high priest right now, constantly praying for me, interceding for me daily. Thank you, Lord. I love you. Amen. 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 Thanks so much for joining us today, and we trust that you were blessed. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to our page and maybe share this word with someone else. Or even better, join us in person at one of our churches yes. one day. Until then, be blessed. Mm -hmm.